This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. After the internal auditors have completed their assignment, they will produce an internal audit report. This is normally given in three parts. Uh, first of all, and indeed is laid out across a page as, as is shown here, this will normally, uh, first of all, describe the deficiencies in internal control. And so it might say, for example, uh, that invoices are not cancelled after they have been paid. Or it might say there have been incidents uh, where employees did not cancel invoices as they should have after they had been paid. So the problem might be uh, basically to do with the design of the internal control system that a control is missing, or the problem might be that although the control should be there in theory, uh, there's been a lapse. It will then normally uh, point out the dangers of this lapse of internal control or this absence of internal control. And this is really uh, almost part of the selling it to management. It, because this internal control isn't there, therefore this could happen. So if it was that invoices are not cancelled after payment, then the danger is, the possible implication is, that the invoice could inadvertently go around the system again and you would make two payments for the one invoice. And then the fix is often very uh, simple. Uh, so if they're not uh, cancelling invoices, then they should cancel invoices. So it is recommended uh, that all invoices are stamped paid when they're paid or you some, some companies kind of perforate holes in the invoice uh, so there's no way uh, you know it could, could go around the system uh, easily again. So these internal audit reports will be uh, submitted uh, probably first to uh, the internal people uh, on the audit committee, uh, and, and certainly they will go to the finance director. If it wasn't a conventional internal audit work on internal control, if it was dealing with some other aspect of uh, um, internal order work, if for example it was uh, investigating a fraud, then obviously it wouldn't be set out quite like this. Uh, you would be given, have, would have been given specific items uh, to report on uh, and then you would uh, effectively uh, would you report to, to comply with that. So we would say, you know, I have been asked to investigate this fraud uh, we discovered that the fraud was carried out by this, 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 and this. This is the way it was done. We think these three people have been involved. Uh, we found the earliest incident of this was 18 months ago. Uh, we think a total of $150,000 has been stolen, and so on. So the internal audit report. I said earlier that it is uh, now not that uncommon to outsource internal audit. Uh, so rather than setting up your own internal, quasi-independent uh, internal audit department, you go to maybe a large firm of accountants and say, will you be my internal auditors? Advantages of that? Uh, well, there are no recruitment costs. Uh, it's immediate, it's instant. Uh, you can access, of course, uh, specialist services. A large firm of accountants might have uh, specialist, uh, say, forensic uh, auditors, uh, where if there is a, uh, to be a, an investigation into fraud, you need special techniques because what they find may have to be presented in court and therefore has to be, in a way, protected and found in a way which is not going to be susceptible to a, you know, a defense lawyer uh, uh, demolishing it. They can give the appropriate amount of time. Uh, by this I, I mean that if we had our own internal audit department, uh, uh, there might not be enough of them, uh, enough to do for the year. Having one internal auditor isn't great. Internal auditors have a, maybe a slightly lonely existence. Uh, uh, other people in the organization kind of say, oh, the internal auditor is coming to check. Uh, they're, they're regarded in some organizations as a kind of... Uh, prefect almost, uh, uh, and therefore if you're the sole internal auditor is going to be perhaps quite a difficult life and one that's maybe susceptible to intimidation. 
Ideally, you want a, a little team of internal auditors, maybe three. They give each other mutual strength and advice. But, but then, of course, your company might not be big enough to fully employ three. If you go to a large external company, it can send people in for five weeks, uh, do their, their audit, then they go off to another client and so on. It can be very flexible. As well as uh, that, if, if something has gone wrong, if a fraud has been discovered, uh, there normally is an element of panic. Uh, and so the external supplier, the internal audit suppliers, can, can bring in a huge number of people, maybe bring in like 10 people, to, to really take the place to bits uh, to discover the extent of this fraud. And it does give more independence. They are not employees of the company. Uh, they're employees of a, a third party. And, and if something embarrassing is found, uh, something which criticizes the financial director, then they will not be in fear of promotion or in fear of their jobs uh, by reporting this. Disadvantages, it's perhaps more costly. Uh, there may be less expertise. So by which I mean, if you are an internal auditor in one company, you get to really know all the little quirks about that company, all the all the problems that they're going to be, the, the strengths of different people within the company. But if you are an external person coming in to do an internal audit function for a couple of months, uh, you may never have been to that company before. You're, you're having to learn an awful lot as you go along to carry out a decent audit. There can be complications if external auditors are used. You don't need to get into that very much. Uh, but there's a, a kind of potential conflict of interest uh, going on, uh, a, 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 a potential what's known as self-review, uh, where maybe the external auditors are going to be reviewing work that was initially performed by people from their own company, and, and it begins to eat into the, the required independence that you would expect from an external auditor. Finally, we look at uh, fraud. So fraud is a risk, of course. Uh, fraud is the intentional act involving deception to gain uh, an unjust or illegal advantage. There are two levels of fraud. First of all, you can have fraudulent financial reporting. Uh, in other words, the directors falsely inflate profits they do that, perhaps to keep their jobs, perhaps to get bigger bonuses, uh, perhaps they're uh, thinking of uh, floating the company in the stock exchange and the bigger the profit, the bigger the issue price. Perhaps they're hoping it to, to sell the company uh, to uh, another company. And again, the, the, the better the profits look, the better the price is going to be paid. So that's fraudulent financial reporting. And then there is misappropriation of assets, basically theft. Theft of cash, theft of inventory, theft of non-current assets is appropriation or misappropriation of assets. It should be uh, a, an integral part of uh, corporate strategy to prevent and detect fraud. So it, it can be a large risk. You have to do a kind of risk assessment. Uh, how susceptible is this business to fraud? How susceptible are the assets to theft? And so on. Uh, and, and, you know, you have to do your risk mapping and so on on this. Uh, and you have to counter these risks as appropriate. Fraud, if it's going to be uh, committed, requires incentive. It requires opportunity. And it requires attitude. Uh, basically, an attitude is a willingness to carry out an illegal activity. Now, here are some examples. So, if we go over to the right-hand side, looking at misappropriation of assets, simple theft. So, the incentive, why would an employee do this? Well, it could be simple greed. It could be that the employees under financial pressure, that they have to pay their mortgage or their rent, or medical bills, whatever it's going to be, uh, and in order to, you know, keep the roof over their heads, 
they are uh, you know they turn to fraud it could be an element of get your own back you dislike the employer you feel the employer hasn't dealt with you fairly uh, and so you have an unofficial way of boosting your salary or boosting your income through fraud so we want to do it or we think we want to do it uh, or we may want to do it then we need opportunity uh, so opportunity it is high if there's a lot of cash involved a lot of small but high value inventory involved if there's poor internal controls so if there's poor internal controls you can you know, issue purchase orders to yourself you can sign off your own overtime statements you can write off friends bad debts and uh, and the like anything like that it, it just opens the, the doors to possibility of fraud poor IT systems IT systems which don't have good password control for example uh, again lays itself open to easy opportunities for fraudulent transactions and finally finally you need an attitude of mind now we've all probably been under from time to time some financial pressure we've all probably from time to time maybe at the same time seen an opportunity for theft but I would imagine that relatively few of us actually take that last step and commit the theft commit the fraud and the reason is basically our morality it might be fear of being caught but let's let's put a positive spin on it let's say the reason we don't do it is that we are moral ethical people what uh, affects us what can eat into to to you know most people's moral and ethical objections to fraud well there can be other people's behavior if you see that your fellow employees routinely routinely fiddle expenses uh, you begin to think why shouldn't I too your, your standards lapse relax a little bit you could dislike the employer and that's you know enough to to get over your moral scruples uh, it could be uh, overriding existing controls uh, it, it could simply you know not really start as uh, fraud but you say I'm going to take a kind of shortcut here uh, to do something and then you find the shortcut works quite well uh, and you're drawn into to a way which is more than just expedience it's in a way of you know, committing the fraud much more fraudulent financial reporting this is where you typically report inflated profits if the profitability of the company is threatened directors like to see the profits going up because that keeps the shareholders happy keeps their jobs there and so on if there's pressure to perform uh, so you know maybe to to get a, a bonus you have to increase the profits by 20 percent there's incentive uh, other forms of incentives uh, uh, around uh, around as well maybe floating share, share, share options if i get the profits up if the share price goes up I can cash in my share options at a nice high price opportunities if there are many estimates and accounting figures so if you're having to estimate uh, the uh, you know will the inventory sell will that debt be received uh, I'm putting up this building it's going to take me three years to put it up how much profit is it safe to take this year uh, these these are all areas which are subject to, to estimates uh, and uh, generous estimates would allow uh, the frauds to be committed at this fraudulent financial reporting level a dominant chief executive interesting this one uh, you may remember back to corporate governance where there is in the UK certainly a rule for listed companies that the CEO and the chairman's functions must be carried out by separate people and the reason for that is when the authorities investigated some big financial scandals they found that a theme that was very common was you had this very powerful charismatic almost bullying person at the top of the organization the power the only power if you like uh, and this person's 
word would, would, would just go, you know, would, would just be taken over and no one would fight against this person. So this person says, I want profits this year to be up 20%. Uh, people would be so frightened of this uh, individual that they would begin to manipulate the figures so that indeed profits were up 20%. Splitting these uh, functions at the top uh, should reduce the possibility, uh, not eliminate it, but certainly reduce the possibility of fraudulent financial reporting. And again, poor internal controls lets people fly, you know, play fast and loose with the figures. At the bottom, poor ethical guidance. Maybe you see nothing wrong with inflating profits. Dishonesty, obviously. Very aggressive targets. You feel under pressure, you feel pushed, you may, may feel aggrieved that there's that, that unreasonable pressure has been put on you uh, and, be, and be, because you feel hard done by this uh, allows this step which you know not to be right but, but allows you to kind of permit yourself to do it. And poor morale, simply being fed up, not, not caring very much, uh, hoping to leave the organisation a couple of years very very quickly and so on you may think to yourself well you know i may as well try and make things look good for this year i'm not going to be here at the end of next year what does it matter what we need uh, for uh, fraud is a fraud risk management strategy and this is prevention detection and response so the way you can prevent fraud is to have a very good system of internal control. The way you can detect fraud uh, is first of all following up on this system of internal control, doing reconciliations, being skeptical, uh, having an internal audit department, uh, for example, is a way of detecting fraud, uh, carrying out analytical procedures, looking at the way ratios have changed, and say that's that's really on the way the, the inventory has moved during that month um, you know is, is there something worth looking at uh, within that that may be indicative of fraud when I at one stage was an auditor one of the things we were taught to do uh, was to look for members of the accounting staff who never took holidays because if they didn't take holidays a reason was that they had to be there kind of all the time to cover up uh, their fraudulent activities. If they went away for two weeks and somebody else was covering from for their job, uh, this other person would say, what on earth is going on here? What are all these journal uh, entries and so on going, going through? And then there is response. Make it known to people uh, that if a fraud is discovered, we will fully investigate it. We will find those who are responsible and will chase them for the missing money. Uh, you will lose your job and we may report you to the police. So, so if the consequences are tough, then it will obviously deter people uh, from committing the fraud. What we want to know, as I've said, is how much was involved, how long was it going on for, how was it done, who was involved, who suffered the losses, because sometimes fraud might be a loss that's eventually suffered by a customer or eventually maybe suffered by a supplier. Most often it's going to be, you know, you know suffered by the company itself, but there can be knock-on effects in some sorts of fraud. And very importantly, how can we prevent it happening again in the future? How can we make our prevention system here, prevention and detection systems here, how can we make them kind of even more uh, watertight so that the idea of a fraud occurring is extremely remote indeed?